Um, first of all, what is the what is the human rights tribunal for? You know, why would somebody bring a complaint to the human rights tribunal, for example, instead of the regular going through the regular court system? So the BC government had repealed the human rights tribunal. It had gotten rid of it, but now it's brought it back. And what it is is a tribunal to adjudicate grievances between members of the public. So people who say that they've been discriminated against either in employment or uh, service or in a publication. Those are the primary functions. And the grounds are typically uh, for complaints or, um, you know, racism, uh, sexism, uh, you know, discrimination on any of these enumerated grounds that uh, our our society is very um, uh, woke about these days. Right. Yes, we sure are. <laughs> um, and so, how do how do cases end up there? Like, does anyone who files a complaint about discrimination get a hearing? No. So there's a process. There's a preliminary. Um, uh, process by which the tribunal takes a look at any complaints that are have come in and they decide whether or not they're going to allow those to proceed and so they they make a preliminary analysis and they say you know this has merit on its face or or this doesn't have merit uh and then they and then they allow it to proceed or they reject it so uh in the cases that we're going to talk about obviously the uh, the complaints were allowed to proceed right so I mean, I think that some people, I mean, I've seen quite a few comments online, for example, uh, from people who are wondering why this particular case actually went through. I mean, on what basis did the tribunal decide that the complaints um, Jessica slash Jonathan Yaniv was, was filing were, were legit? So the tribunal in a May 30th decision said that on its face that Yaniv has a case. Uh, and so they made that uh, determination uh, at the outset. And, I mean, it may have been before all of the evidence was in. Uh, of course, it was before all of the evidence was in and, and you know, no hearing had taken place, but that was what they did at the outset. Mm -hmm. So. And what exactly is he claiming? So, you know, now that, you know, I, I, I understand that he's claiming he was discriminated against based on gender identity, but, you know, is he, is he saying that these women, these estheticians refuse to service him because he's transgender, because he identifies as transgender? How does that exactly work? So when you submit a complaint to the tribunal, you have to say on what ground you're making the complaint. And Yaniv's complaints are all on the ground of gender identity or gender expression. I think that one of them was actually on the ground of sex as well. Uh, but um, f for the purposes of the three cases that uh, um, have become news stories, the complaints are under the ground of gender identity and gender expression. So what that means is that um, when the complainant came and asked my clients for a Brazilian, which is a, a service that they provide to women out of their house mm -hmm. uh, because they operate out of their houses. What Yaniv is contending is that they said no based on either the complainant's identity, gender identity, or gender expression. And so, so those are two separate things. Uh, um, gender identity is how you think of yourself and how you identify uh, yourself. And your expression is how you express to the public and so it's important to note that when uh, you approached my clients um, the complainant was identifying uh, as female according to Yaniv but expressing as male they perceived somebody who was male right the name that they uh, saw on Facebook marketplace was a male name and um, you know, a more or less stereotypical male appearance. And so that was something that was confusing to them because then the complainant said, I'm a woman. And go ahead. Oh, I mean, I like, I mean, the whole thing is confusing. The way that it's being framed in general is confusing because 
uh, from what you're telling me, it sounds like it would have made more sense to file a complaint based on sex to say that these female estheticians then were discriminating against him because he's male, because he has a male body. I mean, it wouldn't have been, I mean, they wouldn't have known anything about his gender expression based on his, his the profiles he was using on Facebook Marketplace, right? Yeah, so the expression was was stereotypically male. That was how my clients perceived Yaniv. Mm. And, uh, but Yaniv is saying, I identify as a woman. But the problem with this case is that how you identify doesn't change your physiology. So sex is a separate ground under Section 8 of the BC Human Rights Code. And Yaniv has brought these complaints reg on the ground of gender identity or gender expression. So how you identify doesn't change your physiology. Mm -hmm. Right? I could identify however I want in my head, but it doesn't change my body. It doesn't change my genitals, right? I could identify as a tomato. It doesn't make me physiologically a tomato. Mm -hmm. And and that's really that's really one of the big issues with this case because Yaniv is on the record as saying that they have male genitals, penis and testicles. So um, that's a service that my clients don't provide. They do not wax that body part, irrespective of somebody's identity. That's yeah. the case. And and I mean, as as far as I'm aware, the process of waxing male genitals is quite different than the process of waxing, like you know, giving a woman a Brazilian bikini wax. That would be a different service. Is that right? I think it's significantly different. So uh, you know, we advance an expert who talked about what the process is in waxing male genitalia. This woman operates a salon on the island, and all she does is wax male genitalia all day long. That's all her salon does. And so she talked in uh, very explicit detail about what the process is and how it's different from waxing female genitalia. And... Uh, there's obvious differences. For example, um, they use a different technique. Uh, they use a different wax for for male and female genitals. And you know, physiologically, there are different uh, reactions uh, when you handle male and female genitals. I mean, there's a physiological reality. So somebody who is providing the service has to handle the individual, the client's penis and testicles for an extended period of time from between 20 minutes to an hour and according to the expert uh, a significant proportion of men become sexually aroused and and get an erection and then they a significant portion of those men want sexual services and so um, you know it seems like there is some expectation even in the industry that 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 service is going to be provided and some men uh, who who attend a different salon that doesn't provide that service become quite belligerent, angry, aggressive, and according to the expert, she's had to go in and rescue her staff from aggressive men who want, you know, they want uh, a hand job in in the room, mm -hmm. uh, following their their uh, their brozillion mm -hmm. or their manzillion, and you know that's not something my con my clients are comfortable with. They work out of their own home. They don't want a naked man, irrespective of how the individual identifies, right? They don't want a person with male biological genitals naked in their home uh, because they're not comfortable for a variety of reasons. Yeah, and I mean, so what it sounds like is, I mean, really what it comes down to is that Yaniv was asking women to touch his penis. Like, he, it's almost like he was asking for... For sexual services, I don't know what uh, Yaniv's expectation was uh, regarding the service, uh, and that's not in evidence. But certainly, if you're asking somebody to give you a Brazilian wax and you have male genitals, they're going to have to touch your penis, and not just touch it, you know, once, like, right. and and then they're done, right? I mean, they're going to have to hold it basically for an extended period of time, and that's that's what the service calls for and that's that's an important detail in this case yeah so have you ever dealt with a case like this before I mean maybe like a case I, I, 
I don't know what it would be comparable, like maybe sex discrimination, like where a man is saying he wants a service and he's not able to get that service because he's a man or, or where somebody was discriminated against, you know, because of how they looked like, you know, maybe a man was wearing traditional female clothes or something like that. Like what's, is, has there been anything else like this in, in Canadian history or that you've dealt with? Specifically dealing with waxing services, no, there's never been anything like it. Um, there was a comparable case in Ontario where a, uh, a doctor was approached by somebody who had had a vaginoplasty and uh, they wanted some work on the labia and the doctor said, I can't because that tissue is different from a natural labia. And, and so I, I'm not comfortable working on it. I'm not trained to work on it. And so the individual filed a complaint at the Human Rights Tribunal in Ontario. And the, the case went to court, I understand, and the tribunal found for the doctor because there was a bona fide occupational issue, right? The doctor was not trained to work on that tissue. is different tissue, right? It had been surgically altered. It wasn't biologically natural female genitalia. And so... Um, you know, if you take that case and you apply it to this case, you would think that because this isn't a service that these women offer, they're not trained, right? And the expert also talked about how, uh, you know, somebody who doesn't know what they're doing can, can tear uh, male tissue because it's thinner. And uh, so you can tear the scrotum and cause, you know, extensive bleeding and you know, significant pain and so you would think that it's a good thing that somebody who doesn't provide the service and is up front what they don't they don't provide that service you would think that they would be acclaimed not uh, uh, not castigated but yeah I mean um, they're protecting your own best interests in a way <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah um, do you think I mean so I was over in the UK sort of recently talking to um, you know, the public and some politicians, because in places like Scotland and Britain, they are looking at new or, you know, updating their gender identity legislation. And so they wanted to hear about what was happening in Canada. And so a lot of people asked me um, if all of this stuff that's going on, you know, people over there had heard about this unique case, despite the fact that our media is not covering it. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So they wanted to know, you know, if this kind of thing is a direct result of Bill C-16. Um, it's And it was hard for me to answer because it's not clear in the law, you know, what's legal and what's illegal. You know, it's not like that, that law says you can't refer to a man who identifies as a trans woman as he, for example. So, you know, it's, uh, what is the law? You know, does, does w how much impact did Bill C-16 have on this case and on the ability of, of Yaniv to come forward with these complaints and have these complaints treated legitimately? So there's no doubt that um, Bill C-16, which is federal legislation, and, and then you have all the provincial human rights legislation, there's no doubt that that has had an impact on on you know other provinces who are looking at adopting these similar laws. As far as what law came first, uh, I I don't recall specifically, but the fact is is that this has become a a significant issue in Canada, and the law provides very little guidance. Like for example, you reference the uh, the use of pronouns, right? Um, you know, from time immemorial. Yeah, since there was an English language, when you say she, that is refer referring to somebody who has a biological, um, there's a biological component to the use of that word. She means something. It refers to biological women, right? And up until, you know, the 1950s or 1960s, there was no contention that anybody was anything but because, you know, science had not progressed to the point where you could remove sexual organs and replace them with a semblance of something else, right? And so the word she has always meant woman, and woman is a thing. Just like going back to my tomato example, right? Tomato is a thing, right? If I say tomato, you instantly get an image in your head of a, a round, red, firm fruit. And, and so words mean something. And so, you know, the law doesn't say 
you have to use a pronoun to describe a male who identifies a woman and use the same pronoun for that individual as you do for women. It doesn't say that, um, but you know that's what some individuals want, and so it's that's creating a complicating factor in society. Mm-hmm. And so, my, you know, my advice to the UK is to be careful about how they go about legislating this issue. Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like the Canadian government really didn't think this through at all. <laughs> I can understand. Uh, I can understand that sentiment. <laughs> So what will this what will the result of this case or the outcome of this case determine really? So one of the key questions is is what service can somebody who is uh, providing a service of, of this kind of intimate nature because it is an intimate service, right? It's not like you know you're selling you're selling hamburgers at a baseball game, right? I mean this is a woman who works out of her home in a room. She's, you know, my clients are either single or they're married and their husband is away. They've got small kids in the home. They are, they're alone, they're vulnerable. They're providing a service for women, uh, for biological women. That's their perception. And so the, one of the big questions in this case is whether or not the state can compel that woman to wax and provide an intimate service for somebody who identifies as a woman but who has male genitals, right, who is biologically male. Right? Can the state compel that service? Will it compel that service? And if the woman refuses, will she be punished for it? Right? To what extent will she be punished for it? These are important questions that are going to be adjudicated for the first time in the country, and uh, you know they're big questions. Yeah, I mean they are really big questions, and uh, you know this is precedent setting. So why? <laughs> I mean, it took. It took the post millennial, and then you know my website covered it also, feminist current, to get this story out, and the mainstream media in Canada wasn't covering it at all. And since there's been some op eds and some coverage of it, but you know, it really took them a long time, and still many of those those outlets and and sites have not covered it. You know, the CBC still hasn't address this case at all. Why do you think that is? Well, there's been crickets from a lot of media organizations in Canada. Uh, a lot of those um, organizations, uh, I mean, it's, it's impossible for me to speculate as to all the reasons, but I think that we can, we can reasonably ascertain some of them. Uh, my, one of my clients went to 26 different lawyers before she found the Justice Center and we and we took her case on on a pro bono basis and what she what she said is that the lawyers that she went to didn't want to take this case because uh, they're afraid of the trans lobby they're afraid of their reputation they're afraid of uh, aligning their 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 good name their good name with uh, the cause of a woman who has been uh, ch- uh, uh, you know, there's a complaint against her that she's a bigot, she's a transphobe. They don't want to take that case, right? And also, you know, there's not a lot of money in in these cases. Uh, there's a lot of work sometimes, but there's not a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And so, but those were the reasons that were given to my client. So, 26 different lawyers, and when she when she found us, and when we took her case, and ultimately speaking, her the complaint against her was withdrawn. She said that she wept big, ugly tears um, in relief. And so you take that situation and you apply it to the Canadian media and, you know, who has been uh, aggressively promoting certain social narratives uh, for a number of years here. And this is, this is the extension of, those, of these laws and these ideas. It's the logical progression of them. And, and the media is silent, and that's too bad, um, because Canadians have a right to know, and Canadians get their, uh, their information, their news from the internet, and if, if Canadian media is boycotting important cases like this, you have an, a media that's not doing its job, and you have an ignorant populace uh, who has a right to know what's going on. Yeah. So. It's, yeah, it's shocking. It's so, it's so unethical, especially as you say, Considering that all of these media outlets in in Canada, you know, the mainstream media in Canada has been 
promoting and reporting on the issue of gender identity and you know transgenderism and gender identity legislation just endlessly you know the cbc talks about this stuff all the time but only from one angle and in a completely biased way you know they've not produced any critical coverage um and you know so they're they're responsible in large part for promoting these narratives and then when something like this comes along to disrupt the narrative suddenly they're silent you know it just really it just i mean it destroys trust right you know we can't trust our public broadcaster to do their jobs yeah pravda yeah right yeah so um three of the women settled in mediation is that correct i uh, it's probably more than that okay uh I, but it's it's hard to say. There's there were 16 complaints at least total. We know that, and uh, two of the complaints um, against clients that we represent were withdrawn, and then there was another complaint against another um, salon that was also withdrawn. But there's no doubt that some of the complaints have been settled. I don't know what the terms were. I don't know if money was paid. I don't know if further concessions were made. You know, a year worth of free Brazilians, uh, Brazilians, right? Uh, who knows? Who knows what the what the settlement terms were? But but the cases are no longer on the books. They didn't proceed to the hearing, and and they're finished. So, you know. And and so, how many of the complaints are are being heard right now? So there's three more to go. We've ran we ran trials on July fourth, fifth, and seventeenth. Uh, and uh, there are three more that are being heard on July 26th, and those are all circumstances where the respondents haven't replied, and so very likely they're not going to show up. They've closed their businesses. I don't know if they've fled the province, uh, but you know they've lost their livelihood <laughs> over these complaints, and I don't know if they're going to be there to to defend against them or not. They may just have gone into hiding. Um, and you know when you see. You know, when you see the with the, you see the difficulties in the case, you can understand why that might be, right? The state doesn't appoint them with a lawyer like it does in criminal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a stigma attached to being labeled a transphobe mm -hmm. or a bigot, um, and so they're afraid. And then so there's and then there's the risk of you know punitive fines uh, against them as well. So and a lot of these people are from racial minorities. And they they don't know the process. They don't have an experience with the Human Rights Tribunal. It's a bewildering process, and so um, you know they haven't responded. And they've made decisions, um, you know, to just try and ride it out as best they can. Yeah, I mean, it would be so stressful um, and intimidating. I can imagine. And you know, and what really what made me mad is that initially, um, Yaniv his name was under a publication ban and yet the the women that he'd filed complaints against were not protected in that way so these women who are worried about being harassed and are you know feeling totally intimidated are worried about being as you say you know labeled as a transphobe and stigmatized in that way they weren't protected at all um and yet yaniv the one who who was you know targeting these people was yeah, and there's a presumption that uh, a court process or a tribunal process is going to be open so that the public can see what's going, to, uh, what's happening, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a state-run body, and citizens have rights. And so, for that reason, the presumption is is that, you know, there's got to be sunshine, right? Let it in. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, when when the publication ban was sought, uh, it was. Um, you know, it was it was an anomaly, and eventually, once there was sufficient evidence to show a variety of things, uh, we applied to lift the publication ban, and the, and the tribunal agreed that it was appropriate to lift it uh, to protect the integrity of of the of the process. So it's that's not normal. That's not routine to to do a publication ban on names of complainants. It's not typical, right? Typically. And you can see why that would be the case, right? Because somebody like Yaniv has made upwards of 20 complaints now to the tribunal 
on a variety of issues. And, you know, if you can, if you can make complaint after complaint after complaint and hide behind anonymity, but your victims are out there in the public, that becomes a problem, right? And so for that reason, typically complainants are also identified so that, uh, so that there's equal, I don't know, <laughs> if I can use the word skin, Accountability, I was going to say skin in the game, but yeah, <laughs> equal accountability. <laughs> yeah, that works too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. Oh, that makes me so angry. Um, so how, I mean, I'm sure lots of people are wondering, how are these women that you're representing doing? I mean, you can't speak to everyone, but you know, it, you, you know it's incredibly stressful. How are they coping with all this? It, across the board, there was tremendous stress. I mean, like I said, one of the women who had the complaint withdrawn against her after we got involved told me that she wept because she had been suffering tremendous anxiety and fear for the last five months, right? But these complaints were made in April 2018. We're in July 2019. And so the women who have had complaints made against them have had this hanging over their head for over a year. And in some of the cases, it's been just debilitating for them because they're afraid. They're, they're not familiar with the process. They've had to close their salon business, so they've lost the income, and they're afraid. And, you know, they're, some of them are on medication. Uh, they're depressed. They're anxious. Uh, there's marital discord. One of them has, uh, you know, her evidence was at the tribunal that, that she put on a tremendous amount of weight because, you know, she's, she's, just, she's just terrified. And if anybody who has ever been through, uh, anybody who has ever been through a court process or a tribunal process can attest to the fact that it's, it's scary um, because it's, it's high stakes for them, right? And, and so it's, uh, they've suffered a lot. All of them have suffered. Some of them have suffered tremendously, and it's not an exaggeration to say that it's it's wrecked their life for like the last year and a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm also wondering, on that note, how people can support these women. Is there anything that that the public can do? Yeah, you know, uh, some some people very gracious graciously have set up a GoFundMe page to help some of the women who have been the subject of these complaints and uh, they're raising money right now and you can uh, find that on Twitter uh, I think it's called the Sisterhood Fund uh, yeah I'll and, link to it um, in the in the notes on YouTube okay great um, and then of course the Justice Center operates uh, as a as a uh, a non-religious secular nonpartisan charity we accept no government money we're entirely donor funded we're representing uh, these salon uh, operators for free, but of course there's costs, and uh, so um, donations are appreciated there as well. Okay, awesome. That's great to hear. Um, when will we hear the final results of this case? So there's a schedule now for written submissions, and uh, the tribunal is going to take a look at the written submissions and then make a decision, create its own written decision. And I expect that that'll be out sometime in the fall or early winter, uh, but it's going to take a while. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking with me about this. I'm so glad that we got an opportunity to chat, and I really appreciate your insight, and I really appreciate you supporting these women, as I'm sure many people across the country do. You know, it's a privilege and an honor to support them, and I appreciate what you do and bringing awareness to the case and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thanks.